The Prime Minister received a rousing welcome. He thanked members of the diaspora for contributing to his election campaign. He emphasized on the growing partnership between India and Japan. And he, when he ended his speech, the attendees broke into chants of Jai Shri Ram and Vande Matram. Take a look. मुझे पता है कि आप में से भी अनेक साथियों का इस जनमत में योगदान रहा है किसी ने भारत आकर के प्रत्यक्ष काम किया मेहनत की 40-45 डिग्री टेम्परेचर पे काम करते रहे कुछ लोगों ने सोशल मीडिया के माध्यम से ट्विटर फेसबुक नरेंद्र मोदी ऐप जो भी जगह से जो भी बात कह सकते हैं पहुंचाने का प्रयास किया कुछ लोगों ने अपने गांव में अपने पुराने दोस्तों को चिट्ठियां लिखी ईमेल भेजे यानी आपने भी एक प्रकार से किसी न किसी रूप में भारत के इस लोकतंत्र के उत्सव को और अधिक ताकतवर बनाया और अधिक प्राणवान बनाया और इसके लिए भी आप सभी का मैं बहुत बहुत आभार व्यक्त करता हूं हमारी लोकतांत्रिक संस्थाएं और लोकतांत्रिक प्रणाली दुनिया में अग्रणी है साथियों भारत की यही शक्ति 21वीं सदी के विश्व को नई उम्मीद देने वाली है ये चुनाव उसका प्रभाव सिर्फ भारत तक सीमित रहने वाले नहीं है विश्व के लोकतांत्रिक मन को ये प्रेरित करने वाली घटना है न्यू इंडिया की आशाओं और आकांक्षाओं को पूरा करने के लिए ये जनादेश मिला है और ये आदेश पूरे विश्व के साथ हमारे संबंधों को भी नई ऊर्जा देगा अब दुनिया भारत के साथ जब बात करेगी तो उसको विश्वास है हाँ भाई ये जनता जनार्दन इन्होंने इस सरकार को चुना है पूर्ण बहुमत के साथ चुना है और इनके साथ जो कुछ भी तय करेंगे ये आगे ले जाएंगे विश्वास अपने आप पैदा होता है साथियों जब दुनिया के साथ भारत के रिश्तों की बात आती है तो जापान को उसमें एक अहम स्थान है ये रिश्ते आज के नहीं है बल्कि सदियों के हैं इनके मूल में आत्मीयता है सद्भावना है एक दूसरे की संस्कृति और सभ्यता के लिए सम्मान है गांधी जी कि एक सिख बचपन से हम लोग सुनते आए हैं समझते आए हैं और वो सिख थी बुरा मत देखो बुरा मत सुनो बुरा मत कहो भारत का बच्चा बच्चा इसे भली भांति जानता है लेकिन बहुत कम लोगों को ये पता है कि जिन तीन बंदरों को इस संदेश के लिए बापू ने चुना उनका जन्मदाता सत्तरवीं सदी का जापान है सेवनटीन सेंचुरी का जापान है मिझारू किकाजारू और इवाजारू प्रधानमंत्री बनने के बाद मुझे मेरे मित्र प्रधानमंत्री सिंजो आबे के साथ मिलकर इस दोस्ती को मजबूत करने का मौका मिला हम अपने डिप्लोमेटिक रिलेशनशिप को राजधानियों और राजनयिकों की औपचारिकताओं के दायरे से बाहर निकालकर सीधे जनता के बीच ले गए प्रधानमंत्री आबे के साथ मैंने टोक्यो के अलावा क्योटो ओसाका कोबे यामानाशी इसकी यात्राएं भी की यहाँ कोबे तो मैं 
कभी कभी गलती हो जाती कभी कहता हूं चार बार कभी कहता हूं पांच बार कभी कहता हूं तीन बार लेकिन बार बार आया हो <laughs> और पीएम नहीं था तब भी आता था आपके साथ बैठता था प्रधानमंत्री आबे जी ने पिछले वर्ष यामानासी में अपने घर में उन्होंने मेरा स्वागत किया उनका ये स्पेशल जेस्टर हर हिंदुस्तानी के दिल को छूने वाली बात थी वरना डिप्लोमेटिक रिलेशन में इस प्रकार का पर्सनल टच बहुत कम होता है दिल्ली के अलावा अहमदाबाद और वाराणसी प्रधान आबे को मेरे मित्र को ले जाने का सौभाग्य मुझे मिला प्रधानमंत्री आबे मेरे संसदीय क्षेत्र और दुनिया की सबसे पुरानी सांस्कृतिक और आध्यात्मिक नगरी में से एक काशी में गंगा आरती में भी शामिल हुए Now it's day two of Home Minister Amit Shah's visit to Jammu and Kashmir. The visit is crucial both in terms of the purpose, symbolism, and the timing. This is the Home Minister's maiden visit to any state after assuming office, and that tells us the government's emphasis on Jammu and Kashmir. The visit has been full of crucial meetings and controversies. Let's start with the controversy. Governor Satyapal Malik received Mr. Amit Shah yesterday at the airport, and that is a breach of protocol. Conventionally, the governor receives only the Prime Minister. Conventions and controversies aside. Amit Shah chaired a high-level meeting of civil administration officials and security agencies yesterday. Officials say that the Home Minister was briefed on the security situation in Jammu and Kashmir, specifically after the Pulwama attacks, and that's point number one. Here's the next major highlight of the visit. Amit Shah has prioritized the safe conduct of the Amar Nath Yatra. The Home Minister even warned officials against complacency with regard to security arrangements for the yatra, and this is an issue of immediate importance because Amar Nath Yatra begins on the 1st of July. Security forces will use technology to ensure safety of devotees, and uh, they will identify and prevent anti-sabotage efforts. All security agencies to be fully alert and take all preventive steps to ensure violence-free yatra. He laid emphasis that there should be no laxity in the enforcement of the standard operating procedures, and the senior officers to continuously supervise all the arrangements. It was also reiterated that forces should ensure best possible use of the latest technologies. Amit Shah's focus on the specifics comes after years of unrest in the valley. The state has been under president's rule since June 2018. Recently, the government extended the president's rule for six more months. Even during the Lok Sabha election, Jammu and Kashmir witnessed protests due to the highway ban. At some point, normalcy, of course, must return to the state. And in the second term, the government is likely to tweak its muscular policy. And that will be the biggest challenge before Amit Shah. Today, the Home Minister visited the family of the Jammu and Kashmir Police Inspector Arshad Ahmed Khan, who was killed in a terror attack. In fact, Arshad was killed in Anantnag on the 12th of June. Amit Shah assured his family of government assistance and offered a job to the martyr's wife. The Home Minister also re-evaluated the government's work in the valley with specific focus on the 18,000 crore rupee development package announced by the Prime Minister in 2015. It is to ensure that the poorest of poor get the benefit of all welfare schemes run by Government of India. There are over 350 of them which are focused on individuals. The second was the arrangements for the Amarnath Yatra and to ensure that security arrangements are beefed up so that the Yatra is conducted successfully. And if necessary, there will be further tightening in the arrangements. And the third area of focus has been the hard work put in by the JNK police and other security forces in improving the security scenario in the state. And he also praised the contribution of the policemen of JNK police who laid down their lives for a larger cause. Amit Shah's visit comes at 
a unique time for the state. Over the last week, the BJP's national vice president had said that the government is ready for talks with Hurriyat leaders within the framework of the Constitution of India. Governor Satyapal Malik has also indicated that the Hurriyat is ready for talks with the government. Amit Shah has started his engagement on Jammu and Kashmir on a positive note. For instance, the Home Ministry presented the JNK Reservation Amendment Bill on Monday. It was the ministry's first legislative activity in Parliament. The bill seeks to extend equal benefits of reservation for people living near Jammu and Kashmir international border and the actual line of control. Now, such steps are likely to bring the people of the valley closer to the government. The Home Minister's visit is a step in the right direction. Let's talk about impediments now. Pakistan will set up roadblocks as India tries to maintain peace in the valley and this is something that the government is well aware of. External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar said as much while addressing a summit in the United Kingdom. He delivered the statement via video link. And I'm quoting from the statement, I think a lot of the problem today is whether Pakistan is prepared to behave as a normal country and as a normal neighbour. I do not think anywhere in the world today you will have a country which has an industry geared towards committing acts of terror. Jay Shankar did not stop there. He said that the large-scale industry of terrorism that runs in Pakistan with the blessing of the state is increasingly unacceptable to India. The External Affairs Minister added that more and more countries now agree with this view. Pakistan's state sponsorship of terrorists will remain central to India's fight against terrorism. India is trying to win over more allies to its side in this effort. In fact, during his address, the External Affairs Minister also urged Britain to be more active in calling out countries like Pakistan. In fact, Pakistan is not just a challenge in Kashmir, it is also proving to be a hindrance in the growth of South Asia. Jay Shankar also highlighted that India offered Pakistan the most favoured nation status. It was to encourage non-discriminatory trade, but Pakistan never reciprocated and the favour was discontinued after the Pulwama terror attack. Pakistan has also resisted connectivity projects that benefit India. Mr Jaishankar said something on these lines when asked why SARC hadn't worked and BIMSTEP was a better bet earlier. SARC has certain problems. I think we all know what it is. Uh, so, I mean, even if you were to put the terrorism issue aside, I mean, there are connectivity issues, there are trade issues out there. Uh, so, uh, so uh, what we are doing in a way, I mean, if you look, why were the BIMSTEC leaders uh, invited for the, for the swearing in? Because I think we see today an energy in BIMSTEC and a possibility in BIMSTEC and a mindset in BIMSTEC. The latest from the parliament today, thankfully no disruption yet. The issue of climate change has finally made it to the Indian parliament. There was a debate in the Rajya Sabha. Leaders from the opposition parties raised several questions before the government. One leader wanted to know about pollution-related deaths. Another claimed that the government rules were being flouted. But climate change is a global issue and India is very much part of the global discourse on climate change. Listen into what Minister of Environment Prakash Javadekar had to say. India is guided by its own values and belief in sustainable lifestyles which respects nature. It is evident from the fact that our share in cumulative historical global greenhouse gas emission is only about 3% and our per capita emission are just about one third of the global average. Our renewable energy capacity stands at more than 78 gigawatts today, which includes 28 gigawatts from solar. We are also investing in energy efficiency measures, sustainable cities and transport systems. Our forest and tree cover has increased by 1% as compared to assessment of 2015. What was encouraging to see was the scope of this debate. It wasn't just limited to statements and questions. Some practical solutions were on offer. The environment minister said that the focus needs to be on adopting new technology. The government is of the view that India is in a position to adopt a cleaner development plan and technology could enable that. Apart from this, several key bills and amendments were also moved. The government and the opposition seem to have found their first flashpoint. It is the Special Economic Zones Amendment Bill. Commerce Minister Piyush Goel tabled it in the upper house today. It was passed with a voice vote in the lower house on Wednesday. And this new bill will allow trusts to set up units in Special Economic Zones, SEZ. It is an amendment to the existing law on SEZs. It replaces an ordinance that was issued earlier. But before the amendment was moved, the Congress issued a three-line whip to its MPs. They had questioned the bill in the lower house as well. Another decision of the government sparked an uproar in Parliament today. This was about taxing pensions to disabled servicemen, meaning that they will be brought under the tax net. 
The opposition has protested the idea and the defense ministry has decided to review the matter. The news is tightening on Nirav Modi, the fugitive diamond jeweler and the prime accused in 13,500 crore rupee fraud at the Punjab National Bank. Swiss authorities have frozen four bank accounts of Nirav Modi and his sister Purvi today. This decision was taken in connection with the probe into allegations of money laundering against Nirav Modi. Reports suggested that Nirav Modi had moved nearly 89 crore rupees from Singapore to Switzerland after India registered a criminal case against him last year. According to sources, the accounts had deposits of over 280 crore rupees. India's enforcement director had earlier made a request to Switzerland to freeze his accounts. The ED has filed a case against Nirav Modi under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, that is the PMLA. The CBI wants to have his accounts attached. Both the ED and the CBI are investigating this fraud case at the Punjab National Bank. Nirav Modi and his uncle Mehul Choksi are being probed for defrauding the Brady House branch of Punjab National Bank in Mumbai. The ED has also named Nirav Modi's sister Purvi Modi as an accused in its charge sheet. It is the end of the road in Nirav Modi's attempts to escape India's probe agencies. That's what it looks like right now. He is behind bars at the Wandsworth Prison in London. His bail plea has been rejected four times. Today, the Westminster Magistrates Court extended his remand till the 25th of July, so one more month. India had placed an extradition request to the authorities in the UK in August last year. After the next hearing, that is on the 29th of July, Nirav Modi could be extradited to India. The law certainly is catching up. Does reservation serve the intended purpose? Are India's socially backward classes gaining from reservation? These questions often result in emotional responses, but these issues also reach the courts. Today, the Bombay High Court has upheld the Maharashtra government's decision to provide reservation to the Maratha community under the social and economically backward classes. So why is this an important matter? One, because of the scale. The state government wants to give 16, 16% reservation to the Maratha community. The court found the 16% reservation unreasonable. The court's decision has sound rationale, we may add. After all, Maharashtra's Backward Commission only recommended 12% reservation for Marathas in employment and 13% in education. The court said that the state has all the rights to give reservation to backward classes and that the state can ex exceed the 50% ceiling for reservation, but it did not agree to the 16% figure. Earlier, the state government had notified the, on this issue on uh, November 30th, 2018. Now, that is legally valid. The High Court's order, uh, in fact, ruffled a few feathers, but political parties seem to be happy. According to the Mandal Commission, Marathas are not a backward class. They are, in fact, categorized as a forward class. Other backward class commissions headed by S.N. Khatri, R.M. Bapat and even the National Backward Class Commission have also concluded that Marathas are not backward class. The question is, has the High Court overlooked the conclusions of all these commissions? Critics say that the Maratha reservation is exclusive in nature, but the state government says the reservation is needed to promote Marathas in service and education. This issue has already had an impact on the medical admissions in the state. There are 156 seats reserved for MS and MD courses for Marathas in Maharashtra's medical colleges. Had the government not brought this special reservation, then these seats would have gone to the open category. Now, what does the law say? Article 15 and 16 of the Constitution of India, as well as the Apex Court judgment in the Indra Swani case, bestows the right to state governments to grant reservation. So the state government has not broken any law technically, or has it? A 1992 Supreme Court order caps reservation in government jobs and education to 50%. But states have used a loophole in this law to extend the cap. At the moment, there are four states which have reservation above 50%. These states pass the reservation under the ninth schedule. Now, laws under the ninth schedule are beyond the purview of judicial review, even if they violate fundamental rights. Tamil Nadu, for instance, has 69% reservation. Maharashtra has 52. Telangana and Haryana also exceed the 50% threshold. Recently, Rajasthan and Gujarat saw such protests by communities to be granted reservation. India's political parties need to understand this matter. It's not about winning elections only by appeasing members of a community. Irrational reservation is going to lead to social discontent. Even Dr. Ambedkar did not envision reservation for eternity. 
With reservation, the policymakers are making a ticking time bomb. At some point in time, the debate over natural justice versus social justice will become too hard to handle. Take the example of Maratha reservation. This whole 16% reservation pitch was made by the Congress and the NCP ahead of the 2014 assembly election. Now the BJP Shiv Sena combined has taken the mantle of social justice upon itself ahead of another assembly election that the state is going for later this year. It's a clear case of politics taking precedence over public policy and planning a sad state of affairs.